So hi everyone, um, my name is Colby Slezak. I'm a PhD student in Scott McWilliams lab at the University of Rhode Island. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about my research related to what talk in the event that you talk a little louder? Yes. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> So if any of you have taken a drive around New England, which I assume you have, um, you'll notice the miles and miles of stone walls we have um, along the roadsides. And so this really shows us that this landscape once was primarily agricultural. Um, but during the late 1800s, as we industrialize um, here in America and in New England, um, a lot of these small family farms are abandoned. And so we've seen a uh, maturation of much of our landscape here and more mature forests. So what does this look like? Um, so you can see here, as I mentioned, there were many small family farms that sprawled across New England in the 1850s. And by the time the 1930s came around, we had much more young forests on the landscape. Um, as you can, see. can you see that? Okay. Well, as you can see in the right image. So. <laughs> um, and so at the peak of young forest, so you know about 50 years or 60 years after the abandonment of these farms, um, populations of young forest species were doing really well. I mean, you can see that here in this graphic. So with American woodcock in the 1970s, we had pretty high populations <coughs> along survey routes. So woodcock um, populations are assessed annually by biologists um, since the late 1960s, and they drive around these predetermined routes to count the number of singing males um, along them. And so we can see that um, into the early 2000s, woodcock populations have really took a pretty steep decline. I mean, it's been about 1% annually um, since this survey started. And so just to give you a little bit of background about um, woodcock, um, they're a migratory game bird. Um, they're also a shorebird. So although they don't live by the ocean or the um, shore, like we think of many of these other shorebirds, they actually live in the forest, so they kind of give up their beach lifestyle to move into this forested landscape. Um, they're pretty strange. They have these really long bills um, with a head style end, so they can actually flex the end of the bill outward to grab earthworms and other invertebrates under the ground. Um, they lay four eggs, like most shorebirds, um, and they do these really charismatic courtship display, um, displays. And so you can see this male here, I just added kind of the squiggly line to signify these flights they make in the spring where they spiral, spiral up in the air and then land at a singing ground um, to try and attract a mate. And I think this um, quote here by Elder Leopold really captures um, why we care about woodcock so much. Um, they're a, a very favored game species, um, especially with people with pointing dogs, but they're also um, loved by bird watchers just because they're so weird. Mm -hmm. um, and so we all um, really appreciate the woodcock and want to keep them on the landscape. Um, and, you know, woodcock are declining, but so are birds everywhere. There's been about three billion birds um, that we think we've lost since 1970. And because of these reductions in young forests that I mentioned, some of these young forest species have been hardest hit. And so um, American woodcock, you know, we still have hope for. We can hopefully help. But in some areas um, of a rough grouse's range, for example, they've been completely extirpated. Um, and all of these species are, have experienced pretty steep declines. Um, and so, because of these declines in woodcock, um, the University of Rhode Island and the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management have been working collaboratively um, over the last decade to try and understand why woodcock are declining and how we can improve their habitat. Um, so one of the first projects that was conducted as part of this collaborative um, was by Roger Massey in 2010 to 2012. Um, and he was looking at the post-breeding male habitat selection of male woodcock here in Rhode Island state management areas. Um, so he was attaching transmitters and tracking their movements to try and see the habitat um, components that woodcock were actually selecting for. And then a master's student, Steve Brenner, um, actually tested, so Roger produced this uh, hotspot map to figure out where woodcock would most likely be in the state based off of these habitat features he identified are important to woodcock. And Steve actually moved birds from high quality spots, as predicted by Roger, to these low quality spots, and they overwhelmingly would return back to the high quality spots. So it showed that Woodcock can actually assess the landscape um, and really do care about these things that Roger modeled um, as part of his work. And then more recently, um, Clay Graham has been participating in the or participated in the Eastern Woodcock Migration Research Cooperative, 
Um, so he was attaching GPS tags, which was a newer technology at the time, um, to try and figure out the influence of pre-migratory condition under Woodcock migration initiation date. Um, and you'll hear more about that later from my advisor, um, Scott McWilliams. So one of the major outcomes of this work um, that the state uses regularly for habitat management is Roger Massey's um, predictive map that I mentioned earlier. Um, and so you can see that here. Uh, the areas in red are areas that are high likelihood that you'll, a woodcock will be there. And those areas in blue are more of the low likelihood area. And so why does this matter? Well, the state can look at these areas and decide on the right, um, where would the management be most beneficial for woodcock? Um, and so those green areas are areas that if you manage for woodcock, it's probably going to help them. And so this has been what the state has been using for the past 10 years to try and decide where to cut on um, their state management areas. One of the shortfalls, um, or more just limitations of Roger's work, was that he didn't have females in his data set. He was only tracking males. Um, female woodcock are incredibly cryptic. Uh, they don't make any displays like the males. You know, you can't catch, capture them in mist nets easily at night. Um, and so you really need pointing dogs to do that. So that's what I did as part of my project, was try and locate woodcock hens across the state. Um, and my two main objectives were to look at the sex-specific differences in their habitat selection. So now expanding that resource selection that Roger looked at out to females as well, and comparing how males and females may differ. And then also looking at the breeding ecology of woodcock in eastern North America. And so I did this at two scales. I have a local study that I um, tracked birds and looked at nests and brood success here in Rhode Island. And then I also participated in Eastern Woodcock Migration Research Cooperative, um, so using those GPS tags like Clay, Clay Graham had um, to try and identify nest sites across the flyway. So I mentioned um, a flyway to you just a second ago. Um, so I'll, I'll be talking about two different scales throughout this talk. So I have some of my studies are local here in Rhode Island. And at the beginning of the section, you'll see this image on the left. And then on the right, that's the flyway scale. So in North America, our migratory birds are managed in four flyways. Um, we're in the Atlantic flyway, that purple section all the way to the right. So if you see that at the beginning of the section, I'm talking about um, the whole entire flyway. So the, um, my first objective that I mentioned was the sex-specific differences in habitat selection, so trying to see how male and female woodcock differ in what they select for here in Rhode Island. Um, and this graphic here on the left shows the uh, annual cycle for woodcock, so kind of separated into three different stages, molt, breeding, and migration. Um, the lightest section in the middle is molt, the darker blue is breeding, and then the darkest blue is migration. And you can see when these are happening, um, you have the two spring migrations. Birds are molting in late summer, um, and they're breeding during early spring, April and May. So for the focus of this talk, I'm talking about the period um, right after breeding and right before fall migration. <coughs> so as I mentioned, we're gonna, I wanted to compare how the post-breeding habitat selection of male and female woodcock differs. And that's just so we can have better management here in the state and try to promote both sexes of woodcock to hopefully increase population. Um, so Roger had trouble capturing females. They're incredibly hard to capture using mist nets, but he um, utilized trained hunting dogs. So a lot of these hunters go out and hunt woodcock in the fall <laughs> recreationally. Um, and other states have been successful in using pointing dogs to locate nests um, and hens with chicks because they sit very tight. And so when the dog goes on point, you can see in this photo on the left, Toga, one of our all-star dogs, um, pointing at us. Um, we can go up and actually hand that with a long handle net to hen and attach a VHF tag to track her movements. Um, and I mentioned mist nets a few times now about how we capture males. And there's a photo of that in the bottom right there of us setting up one. It's pretty much a large volleyball net. Um, we play a male woodcock song in front of it. They get mad because someone's <laughs> in their territory. Um, and we capture them really nicely and can attach a VHF tag. <coughs> um, and a VHF tag, so I keep saying that we're tracking these birds. Um, in the middle there is the tag, so it sits on the back of the woodcock um, and wraps around their belly, so just like a backpack, you know, harness around them. Um, and then this pulses, and we can, you know, based off the signal and the, the pitch, we can figure out how close we are to the bird. 
So once we have all these birds tagged, we're out on, you know, in these really thick uh, forest areas. Um, they're not very pleasant to track in. Um, that's where my technicians grew up. Um, and the, the kind of the life cycle of a woodcock tracking technician is they're like, you want me to go in that? And, it's <laughs> and then by the end of summer, they're like, oh, that's perfect woodcock habitat. Um, so if, if you need more convincing, I promise you they are there. Um, and we have many uh, scrapes <laughs> and bruises to prove that. <laughs> Um, and so using all of this tracking information that we collect throughout the summer, so we're tracking the birds, taking GPS locations, we can build home ranges that can encompass all of these woodcock movements. Um, and in these home ranges, um, this is just where the birds are feeding, where they're nesting, uh, where they may be resting, where they're roosting. So it's just capturing where they're spending a majority of their time. And when we overlay these home ranges um, on our state management area, so you can see that's a great swamp management area um, in southern Rhode Island, we can look at what habitat features are underneath these to see what are woodcocks selecting for preferen preferentially in their um, habitat. So you can see a great swamp, um, if it, for those of you that know it well, um, they're mostly in those really wet areas on the back side of that impoundment. So using wetland forests, um, that's pretty typical of a woodcock in the summer. So what did we find after tracking all these males and females? Well, we found, unsurprisingly, that both sexes of woodcock really like wetland forests. Um, they like riparian corridors. They like flat areas. This makes sense because they eat earthworms, so they like moist soils. Um, and they like to be nearby young forests. Um, but the main thing we were most interested in is how do these two sexes differ? Um, so if you're a female woodcock in the post-breeding period, you really like riparian corridors. And if you're a male, you really like flat areas and nearby young forests. And so you may ask yourself, why do females like riparian areas more than males, and why do males like these singing, um, these young forest areas? I mean, I think it may be related to uh, actually the breeding season. So for many migratory species, um, they have a limited amount of time on the breeding ground. So in the spring, they breed, they display, they nest. Then after that, they spend the rest of the summer in these sites, and so it's a perfect time for them to assess the actual quality of the habitat for the, pro the next uh, breeding season, um, because they migrate south and then they're no longer there, so they have to assess it while they're still on the actual site. And this allows them in the spring to really quickly um, start displaying for the males and for the females to start nesting and not have to search around because they've already selected the site. So these findings um, can be directly used for management. So I showed you the hotspot map that Roger had made um, back in 2010. Um, but now we've updated that map on the left here using 11 years of tracking data. So all these projects together we combined <coughs> and now have a data set that includes 150 males tracked in Rhode Island, which is the largest study of Woodcock. Um, and then on the right, we now have females from my two years of research. Um, and so we can compare how, you know, areas that are high for males, are they also high for females, or are there different, you know, components that makes certain areas better than another? And this has really been the work of several dedicated technicians, grad students, postdocs in Scotland, Illinois, so um, it's a long time coming and really useful for the state. Um, and now shifting gears to the second objective. So this is the breeding ecology of woodcock in eastern North America. So this was the flyway project I had mentioned. So you can see we're looking at the flyway scale now. Um, and I just want to mention at the start of this section that we typically think of areas that woodcock breed as northern states. So you can see here in pink um, areas on the east coast at least, um, north of Pennsylvania, up into Canada. Um, and then the southern portion of the range, more for just um, winter. So are we, I can't see Rhode Island on that map on the left, is it, are we year round or? <laughs> this is considered a breeding location. Just breeding? They're yeah, there is some that stay year round, yes. There are some? Yeah. Okay. Um, a, a small percentage, yeah. but yeah. Um, so the main objective of this work was to understand more about the breeding system of woodcock. Um, we know relatively little about the breeding system of woodcock. It's actually quite mysterious and hard to study because they're doing all these activities at night. Um, they're really hard to observe. Um, 
And migration technology to actually track migrations is new, so it only came out about four years ago for Woodcock. Um, and so this is part of the Eastern Woodcock Migration Research Cooperative I've mentioned a few times now. Um, and I really encourage you to check out the website. It's woodcockmigration.org. And you can actually follow all these Woodcock's migration, um, and they give updates periodically during the spring and fall as the birds are moving. Um, so different than VHF tags, this GPS product, uh, this GPS project, you actually don't have to walk through all that awful forest habitat. Um, and the data is actually just downloaded right to your computer. Um, so that tag right there in the bottom right is what we're attaching. It's a little bit bigger than those VHF tags. Um, and how we're actually capturing birds for this portion of the project is we're going out at night in that middle photo. And we're using spotlights while they're out roosting in fields. Woodcock like to fly out to these open areas to roost at night. Um, and you can actually pretty much blind them the light and then capture them with a long-handled net really easily. And then we attach the GPS and they go on their way. So this GPS data, um, so the tag on the bird is communicating with satellites. Satellites communicate with our computer, and we get really nice detailed GPS information. So to give you an idea of this um, GPS data, <coughs> up in the upper right there, you can see we tagged some birds in Rhode Island. They start moving south in the fall. Um, they spend some time down in their wintering areas. So that's the winter period. And then they start moving back north in the spring. And so we have really detailed movements of what these woodcock are doing for the first time. And so this is how it connects back to what I was saying about learning more about their breeding system. Um, because this really detailed movement data allows us to look at things like step length. And all step length is, which is the y-axis here, is the distance moved between subsequent GPS fixes. So if they took a point on Monday and then on Tuesday, it's how far they moved between those, that one day period. Um, so you can see here this first bird on the left portion of the plot. Um, in March and April, the points are kind of fluctuating. It's moving some small distances, some large distances. But then when we get into the breeding se season during mid-April into early May, you can see that the points for a period of time got really, really short. Um, and so we thought these birds might be nesting. So we can start to identify nest sites using this type of data. <coughs> and so seen another way on top of some aerial imagery, um, you can see that the step lengths are really small. The bird's concentrating its movement. Um, it took some ranging movements maybe to feed, but it was primarily in this one spot spending time. And so it's a suspected nest site so that we can um, actually send um, cooperators out to try and verify it. So we relied on other cooperators as part of this Eastern Wood Woodcock Migration Cooperative to actually go out to our suspected nest sites and verify if the bird was indeed nesting. And this is no easy task. Um, <laughs> because we only get about a point every other day. So you know, on Monday, if I have a point, I send them out, maybe they make it there Thursday. Um, they're going off of that point for Monday. So hopefully the nest hasn't been eaten. Hopefully um, the bird hasn't been eaten. Um, there's so many variables at play. Um, and you can see in this bottom right photo there that woodcock nests are also extremely camouflaged. Um, there's a bird sitting on a nest in that photo. <coughs> you can't even see. Um, and then also, as I mentioned, some had already been predated by the time the people got there. Um, and so in this left photo, one of the biologists actually confirmed a nest that had broken eggshells. So something had come along, eaten the nest, but he was still able to find it. So we were pretty impressed with their abilities to locate these across the landscape. And these were just some of the cool photos we got. Um, so the two photos on the left are birds in Canada. Um, so cooperators traveled out to a suspected nest site, found um, a woodcock nesting on the ground, and captured these really cool photos. <coughs> and then the photo all the way on the right um, was taken in Maine. And you can see um, there's some freshly fallen snow. Um, it had just finished snowing. The biologist trekked up this mountain to get there. Um, and when she got there, she found that small depression, just with some broken eggshells, and the snow still melted. So the Bird had ju just, you know, the nest had just been created when she arrived there, so we thought that was pretty cool. So I mentioned these nests are really hard to find, they're really hard to see. Um, so if you look back at that bird I showed you earlier, it was nesting in mid-April. Um, but you can see that there was also some really small concentrated movement in mid-May. Um, and so we missed some nests, and we knew that um, just 
because they're really hard to find. We may have not gotten there in time. There may have been access issues. Um, but in total, we found 26 nests um, for, as part of this project um, during the two years we did it. And one of the interesting things we found were that some of these birds were actually re-nesting, um, but not only were they re-nesting, they were moving these really considerable distance to their next nesting attempt. Um, so yeah, moving several states away to nest again, which is really unusual in birds. Um, and this is called itinerant breeding. So all that means is that they breed in two locations in the same year. Um, and it's only been found in other, only seven other species of birds. Um, the most closely related to the woodcock is the snowy clover out in California. So when we saw this you know, really cool finding, um, we were curious how often it was happening in the population, and we also wanted to go back and try to find any nests that we may have missed. So using the information from our verified nests from all the biologists traveling around, um, we knew what woodcock nesting looked like. We knew that they took really small step lengths. We knew they were spending time in an area for about five days at least. Um, it seemed like most nests were getting created around the five day mark or being successful. Um, and so we used this computer program to try and uh, identify nests using these, this information. And so we did this with a larger data set. So this project, you know, the Woodcock Cooperative, has been happening for four years now. We were only you know, identifying nests for two of these years. So we applied it to this larger data set. And when we applied it to the data set, we had 92% accuracy on the verified nests that we did find. So it showed that the program worked really well. Um, it was finding the nests that we were finding. Um, and one of the really cool things we found was that woodcock are actually nesting in pretty high densities across the breeding range. So it's really the, the peak of, so this is across the population that we were studying. Um, and so the first nesters are generally happening around 35 degrees latitude. Um, and then if, when this, if this nest fails, the bird will move um, and have another nest attempt somewhere near 41 degrees latitude and then continuously moving northward as the nests fail. Um, and so you can see, um, and I mentioned earlier that we think of woodcock breeding you know, above Pennsylvania, so around you know, 40 degrees or so. Um, but there's actually an importance of this southern area for first nesters in this population. <coughs> And you can see that woodcock nests, you know, a lot of times. They'll re-nest up to five times, it seems. So pretty uh, energetically expensive. And I mentioned, you know, the importance of this whole area rather than just this smaller breeding range we had originally thought of. So how does something like this evolve in woodcock? Um, well, the other birds that this has been found in, it's usually related to the fact that they live in these really short-term habitats. So you know, there may be seasonal droughts or um, habitat that they use only stays in the landscape for a short period of time before it gets too mature. I mean, woodcock are a good example of this because they nest in young forest areas, um, and young forests mature very fast. So they can't be too um, stuck on one breeding site. Um, they have to be able to move, you know, because if they live for five years, that site may no longer be good that was when they were like a year old. We think woodcock have a really low cost of reproduction, um, just based off the fact they can nest five times in a season while migrating, um, shows that it must not cost them much to lay eggs each year. Woodcock also have a very prolonged breeding season. You may have noticed in that plot that they're nesting all the way from January in the southern portion of their range into you know, mid to late July in northern um, portions of Canada. Um, so this really extended breeding period, low cost of reproduction, the fact that they can re-nest very quickly um, and that they can have several attempts seems to lead us to think that this is maybe how it evolved in woodcock. Um, and this ephemeral habitat also kind of, you know, um, seems to make sense with other species as well, that they don't, you know, their habitat doesn't last long, um, so they have to be able to pick up and move. Um, so the implications of this work, um, it really shows that, you know, what we knew, know about woodcock um, isn't absolute. It's always changing. We're learning new things with new technologies. Um, and you know, we originally thought that this breeding range was so much smaller than it actually is. It seems like there's actually an importance of the entire um, flyway in woodcock breeding annually. 
Um, so it really highlights um, the need for more cooperative uh, research projects like the Eastern Woodcock Migration Research Cooperative um, and how we need to manage um, forests more collaboratively. So not just creating breeding habitat in the northern portion of the range, but also in the southern portion. And then I mentioned earlier that I have this more local study, so I'm looking at breeding ecology of Woodcock in Rhode Island. Um, so that's what this, I don't have as much results for this section, so it's much more preliminary. Um, but again, we were using the pointing dogs to try and locate nests across the state and chicks. Um, and these dogs hold incredibly tight um, and are very well behaved. So you can see that one dog there looking right at a chick in someone's hand um, and just sitting there very patiently. And so this project, um, we were, like I said, you know, we were capturing hens to learn more about their habitat use, but also to learn more about where they're nesting on the landscape. Um, and we were also attaching really tiny transmitters to the chicks to try and get more information about survival, which I'll analyze in the coming year. So one of the main um, outcomes of this work will be some information about nest site selection here in Rhode Island. So using all these nests we're finding with the dogs across the state, um, we can start to ask questions about where are they found on the landscape. Um, so you can see all of our study areas there in color. And one of the things that has popped out to us right away is that they're often found along streams. So kind of what I was saying earlier about the summertime, they're using streams, um, probably for breeding habitat. And that's also what we're seeing here with this nesting study. And then once we know, you know where these nests are on the landscape, we can ask questions about what the habitat above them is. Is it up in the forest? Is it mature forest? Um, and we can also um, get more fine-scale data, like what is the vegetation like right around a nest site? And so we've been taking some really uh, fine-scale vegetation data measurements, like stem density, canopy cover, um, to try to see what woodcock are selecting for here in Rhode Island. And if you take anything away from this talk, um, I hope you recognize the importance of young forests. Um, and if you really want to support a diversity of species, so not only woodcock, but other songbird species, um, snakes, mammals, um, you really need um, forest cutting. So it's not always a bad thing, um, even though it's commonly associated with it. And I encourage you, um, if you are a landowner in Rhode Island that has uh, 10 or 20 acres, um, to check out the Rhode Island Woods website. Um, we have a coverts program here in Rhode Island where you can get a tax break and help these species by converting part of your property into early successional young forests. And with that, I'll take any questions you may have. <laughs> yes? Um, any plans to share your upcoming results on the Rhode Island study with um, Fish and Game, Rhode DEM? Are they interested at all? Yes, yeah, so they're funding um, a lot of this work. So. Um, they'll be using these products directly. Okay, so they're intimately involved with their Yeah, program. yep, so they've been involved for the entire 10 years, um, sort of providing funding. Um, and they use these uh, habitat predictive maps directly to you know, decide where to cut the new forest. Um, and they're hoping you know, to learn more about breeding so that they can create more breeding habitat for Woodcock here too. Because really, everything we've done is focused on males. And that's true for most of their range. And um, the fact that there are itinerant breeders, I would imagine presupposes that females and males are probably traveling in close conjunction for the majority of their breeding season, January through July. Uh, yet the males prefer a more open uh, habitat to display, and the females prefer, obviously, uh, riparian forested areas to nest in. Um, that doesn't obviously the preference for the two different habitats makes no difference as to um, their breeding success because they're usually very close to one another in that situation. Yeah, so one of the you know the interesting things about woodcock is they really need a mosaic of habitat. So they need young forest, you know, near riparian areas. So they use like a diversity of landscapes, so they're often called an umbrella species that was mentioned earlier in the uh, keynote. Um, but that depends on their, 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 their gender, does it not? Yeah, so we were looking at the post-breeding period, though. Oh, um, okay. So in the spring, the males are usually, we think, select their singing areas, so their open areas, based on proximity to woodcock nesting cover. So we could actually 
the males are choosing their site based off of where the females want to nest because we think that may be more attractive to females. You know, a male that's right near really good nesting cover. Um, and woodcock don't pair, so you know. Um, but yeah, they, they, they 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 can produce up to five clutches of of eggs a year, yeah. but they don't pair. Yeah, and so the woodcock display the entire northward migration, so. Males and females, you know, the females are interacting with many males, so they have the opportunity to mate several different times with different males as they migrate north. So there's no pairing, and females take care of the young on their own, so the males have no involvement. So when they have young, they'll stay in the forest. Um, oftentimes, I, I did track them a few times at night um, for various reasons, but they would be alongside streams or in pretty thick cover just to, I think, avoid predators. Because the females are really tethered to the chicks. Um, the chicks have high predation rates, which is common of most ground nesting birds. So, is there, yeah. is there specificity like in terms of? So on, the, on a property near us, there's a, there's a male we have seen every year. Mm -hmm. But are they picking the site and then trying to attract the female? Or, <coughs> so if they're going back to that site, is that? Yeah, so that, that male's probably had success, you know, with breeding attempts there. Um, and it's probably really nice, uh, nearby, really nice nesting habitat. So females are in those areas, um, and so the females are probably visiting him. So he has incentive to keep going back to that site. It's really a female-driven but Colby, let's take one more question so we have time for Scott to come next So I have a goofy question. Uh -huh. Why do they walk the way they do? <laughs> <laughs> so um, that is, that's debated, but some people think they're actually um, trying to like listen for earthworms or try to like feel the movement of earthworms. Um, and it's even been hypothesized that it's like a distraction behavior for predators. Um, so we're not really sure exactly why, but it is interesting to look yeah. at. <laughs> Thanks. So Colby could have taken the whole 45 minutes, <laughs> but I we, we thought that it would be a nice way to combine two talks because I'm going to talk about the rest of the annual cycle. So what happens after they leave Rhode Island and how important is Rhode Island to some of the, the, the strategies that they use during migration. So this is called in the bird world and you may know of it, a cross seasonal effect. So what happens in one place might have an effect on what happens in another. And this is work, uh, Colby mentioned this, this is work of Clayton Grams. Uh, so I don't do anything. I just have the grad students do everything. And then I tell their story. Uh, did this work? All right, so there's the Woodcock annual cycle seen in a slightly different way. And what Colby talked about was this sort of migration to breeding areas and sort of this portion of the annual cycle. What I'm going to talk about is what happens after breeding and during that migration period and where do they go in the winter. Okay, and Colby mentioned we have only had transmitters in the last three or four years that actually allow us to address this question. So you're getting to see some of the newest information on, on Woodcock migration. <laughs> Said another way, what I'm gonna show you is what happens in Rhode Island just prior to their migration and what quality of areas do they use? How does that influence their condition <coughs> prior to migration? And then how does that influence their migration strategy? Where they go, how long do they take, and so forth. Okay? And you already know about Roger's work. He, he produced this, uh, this map that allows us to, to, to quantify the habitat quality. Because we have that, if we know where the birds were hanging out prior to migration, we can tell whether it's good quality, poor quality areas. And then we can look at how that influences uh, their migration strategy. There's one other aspect that you can get at if you track birds during this period of time, so from breeding areas to wintering areas, and it's related to this concept called migratory connectivity. So it's the extent to which individuals from discrete breeding areas go to discrete non-breeding areas, or vice versa. So I've just given you three sort of ends of the continuum examples. So something like uh, a rose-breasted grosbeak has defined breeding areas, and those populations go to predefined different winter areas. And so we call that a strong connectivity. There's a strong relationship between where they go for breeding and where they go during the winter areas. There's some intermediate 
kind of populations like cedar waxwings. <laughs> On the other end of the continuum are things like green teal. A variety of different breeding areas, and they mix all up in the wintering areas. And you can imagine there's different conservation scenarios for these different kinds of connectivity. Okay? So part of the reason why we conducted this study was also to estimate the migratory connectivity in woodcock. All right, so in words, this is what I'm going to show you. So the, we're, we're, one of the goals is how does body condition and quality of the post breeding areas influence their migration strategy, right? And if you think about that for a minute, if woodcock are hanging out in better quality areas versus lower quality, how might that influence their, their preparedness for, for breeding? So one hypothesis that you might come up with is those that hang out in higher quality areas might depart earlier because they can fatten up much faster. And they might have more fat because they've been able to be in higher quality area. I'm seeing nods. You're agreeing with these, that hypothesis. Mm -hmm. uh, the second, a second hypothesis might be that when they get that higher or lower bird condition at fall departure, that might affect the timing, pace, movements during migration. And I didn't bother to predict specifically because there's a, diff a bunch of different ways that that might go. But all I want to convince you of is it might be interesting to look at condition and how that relates to migration. So I'm going to show you results for both those things. And then lastly, one of our other goals was we did not know before this study where the heck Rhode Island breeding birds go. Okay, so this is the first study because we have these, these new kinds of transmitters we can actually track. All right, so some of the methods are the same as what Colby just talked about. We catch birds in the spring, we put on these VHF tracking devices, uh, we track them. As Colby said, it, it can be really difficult. In this case, it's really difficult because goats like to follow you around <laughs> while you're trying to find your woodcock. So there's all kinds of obstacles and things to doing this kind of work. So what's different about this particular study is Clay then went out at night and he recaptured 20 of those 67 individuals that we tracked throughout the summer. So you recapture them. Why do we need to recapture them? Because we need to swap out their VHF transmitter for these GPS transmitters that, that, that connect to satellites. So we can track them without trying to guess where the heck they are and trying to find it with the VHF. So he was able to do that for 20 individuals that he tracked throughout the summer and put on those GPS transmitters. And remember, because of Roger Massey's work, if we found a bird that was right here all summer, it's going to be in lower quality areas. We can predict that from the map. Areas that are higher quality, we know they're in higher quality areas. So we can predict the quality of the areas that the birds used prior to migration. And then I'm not going to go into the details of how we do this, but we have a, a very clever way to, for a living bird, estimate its amount of total body fat. By the way, they use the same exact technique for you if you ever get a total body <laughs> fat. Uh, measure so we can do the same thing with our birds and if you do that all these each of these dots is a bird that's caught at a specific time and this is the overall relationship that we find in the population of Rhode Island breeding birds and what do I mean by that the birds pretty much just hang out they don't start fattening until about mid-September and then on average individuals start fattening and they fatten at about a half a gram a day okay so why is this helpful that means if the bird departs on October 27th, we can estimate it left with about 25 grams of fat. If it waited until late November, it might have twice that amount. Okay, so we can use this relationship. So we're going to get two pieces of information from every bird. We're going to get what, what kind of quality of area did it hang out in during the summer, and how fat was it upon departure, because we know exactly when it departs. And then just like you, if I tracked you with your cell phone on vacation, we can get this kind of information for every single individual. When did you leave? When did you arrive on your wintering area? How, uh, how far did you go? How many times did you stop? Where did you stop at the Holiday Inn or <laughs> mobile home? Uh, how long did you stop for? How long was your overall migration? And then you can calculate the rate of migration. So we can get all that kind of very useful information for all the individuals that we track. All right, so what did we find out? First of all, as your question alluded to, we have a partial migration population of woodcock. What do I mean by that? Of the 20 birds we found, a quarter of them ended up staying in Rhode Island. Okay, and we all probably know that, right? We see occasionally woodcock that are hanging out all winter long. So we have a quarter of the population ended up staying, 
and the other three quarters of the population was migratory. Okay? How does that relate to the habitat quality? All the individuals that were migratory came from high quality areas or some hung out in low quality. Okay? Whereas those individuals that stuck around were all in low quality. Okay? So we see that habitat quality does relate to migration strategy. Secondly, a little more specifically, so here's our high and low quality areas. Now we can estimate how much fat there was. And what I've done is color coded, light colors are early in the season, right around 1st of November. Whereas the bluer colors are, they, they departed later. What do you notice? Birds from high quality areas left earlier than birds from the higher quality areas. Although there were some birds in the lower quality areas that also left early. And on average, those birds that hung out in high quality areas throughout the summer not only departed earlier, but they left with less fat. Mm. If you remember the hypotheses, that's a little bit counterintuitive. So again, the landscape quality did relate to the fall migration strategies, but in a slightly more different way than we thought. All right, so now let's look at the tracks. So remember, of the 20 birds we're following, five stayed in Rhode Island. <coughs> Another five, so another quarter of the individuals, went from Rhode Island pretty much directly to where they spent the winter. Okay? And I've got a couple other symbols here. So the reds are where they ended up hanging out in, in the winter. And the open circles are, they stayed the day, they leave the next night. So woodcock are nocturnal migrants. They'll leave at dusk-ish, and they'll fly a certain distance. If they stop, just stayed the day and left the next day, uh, sorry, the next night. We didn't call that a stopover. We just said they, they stopped, they stayed, and then they left the next night. So to call it a stopover, they have to stay that next night at least. Okay? So we have this quarter of the population left Rhode Island, and yes, they stopped during the day because they didn't fly the whole way in one day, but they only stayed for a short period of time, and we call it no stopover. All right, so that's a quarter. Another roughly quarter stopped once on their way to their winter meals. So for example, this bird left the Rhode Island, it stopped for just the day in uh, just past Connecticut, New York, and then in northern parts of Philadelphia, it stopped for several nights. And then it continued down to Maryland, Delaware, and one of those birds that was this way stopped, another bird kept going and went all the way to Alabama. Okay, so those are birds, another quarter stopped once. And then another quarter, Stop twice or more. Okay? And look at where the red dots are. I hope you noticed that the birds that had more stopovers went a little bit further south on average. Mm -hmm. Right? The birds that, that stopped less stayed a little bit further north. Interestingly enough, these are the birds that I showed you came from high quality areas. So the birds that were in higher quality areas left the less fat, departed earlier, they arrived earlier, and they went further. Okay? So the, so the habitat quality in Rhode Island influences, is related to their migration strategy. All right, so let's revisit those hypotheses. How does body condition and quality of post breeding areas influence migration stays? Yep, birds from high quality areas start, departed earlier, but they departed with less fat, not more fat. Okay? And those were also those birds that went furthest, stopped over many times. So we think what's happening is, they depart earlier, maybe they're higher quality individuals, and then they just hop and skip their way down to those furtherly southerly areas, and those stopover sites are very important in refueling and so forth. Whereas the other birds, from lower quality areas on average, fatten up more in Rhode Island and then migrate more directly to their winter area. And then I did show you that bird condition at fall departure was related to the timing, pace, and distance of migration, but in sort of complicated ways. All right, so what do we conclude, conclude from this? So this is all the same data I just showed you. So we, we would classify these as non-facultative partial migrants. That sounds like a mouthful, but it tells you a lot about what Woodcock are doing for Rhode Island. First of all, remember why I called things partial migrants? is because we have some residents and some migrants, right? So they're partial migrants. Why non-facultative? What I mean by that is the environmental conditions don't seem to influence these kinds of migration strategy differences. The, if you read the Woodcock literature, especially the, 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 the common literature, 
Um, in, poor, in, in fairly benign winters, folks tend to see more woodcock hanging around, so maybe when it's a benign winter, more birds stick around. Mm -hmm. This evidence all comes from the same two faults. And we see the same variation with the same environmental conditions. So we don't actually think that the environmental conditions are really driving a lot of the variation that I showed you today. So that's why we're calling it non-facultative. It doesn't seem to be facultative in the sense that they assess their, the winter conditions and they decide whether to stay or to, to go uh, based on it. Okay. The second conclusion I want, <coughs> want you to take away is this is a low migratory connectivity population, right? We have a single breeding area and they go, just look at where those red dots are. They're all over the, the wintering area. Okay. And we now know from the, the Eastern Woodcock uh, Migration Collaborative, the same pattern occurs in different breeding populations. That we're, we're, we're the green wing teal-like connectivity. Okay? Many different populations breeding and uh, lots, of, lots of mixing on the winter years. And then you combine it with what Colby was just talking about, where females are starting to breed in the south, they're mating with males down south, different males up here. We've got a, a population of woodcock in the east it's very much uh, mixed in terms of population sources. And of course, that has conservation management needs. Do we need to worry about specifically conserving areas in Rhode Island? Well, there's a bunch of breeding areas. Do we have to worry about cons specifically a place in Alabama? Not really, because there's a mixture of places throughout. So, on the, so if you're a, a conservationist, you actually have to worry about a lot of areas in the winter areas, a lot of areas in the breeding areas. And it's not necessarily evident here, but there's some key stopover sites in the Delmarva Peninsula that birds tend to congregate in, on migration. Okay, so we also suggested some conservation measures for those particular areas because it seems to be some bottlenecks during migration. And with that, we'll thank all the folks, some of the same folks that uh, Colby talked about, and we'll be glad to answer any questions either from Colby Stopover or mine. Yeah. Scott, would, would you talk about um, the advantage of being a, having a lower body fat proportion mm. when you're starting migration? Right. So it's not necessarily an advantage of being lower, it's just those individuals seem to go someplace else, use some fat to get there, but then spend more time at those stopover sites. So the stopover sites are relatively more important for that kind of migration strategy in Woodcock, whereas others, the fat stores that they put on in Rhode Island specifically, are especially important. But how about the energetics of migrating with a larger body mass? Sure, yeah. So <laughs> a, a bird the size of a Woodcock is putting on, so I, I, I included it in one of those graphics, so it's, males are smaller than females. So males are somewhere in the 120 to 160 gram range. Females go up to about 280 grams. And the, mo the fat amounts that I was showing you that asked them about go from 20 to 50 grams. So they don't, they're not uh, a black bull warbler that puts on more than half of its body mass or more in body fat. They are putting on a small amount relatively. Um, and then they're using that. And the body size of those birds um, allows them to reduce the overall costs of those migrations. So they actually, and they don't fly so far. They're short distance migrants in any case. So I don't think the energetic cost of migration is as much as we're used to thinking for other species. Mind you, that plays into Colby's part of the talk too. How the heck do females breed in all these different places and mix in migration in between? It only works if the costs of migration are, are proportionally lower. Did you check those those people who had lo those birds that had longer stopovers uh, caused by weather versus caused by need to fuel up? Yeah. So we, we we included we had predictive models that tried to explain why the phenology was such. Most of that stuff in the years that we studied them, weather did not explain it. There has been years, like especially in the Delmarva Peninsula, we had some big snow years yeah. where a lot of woodcock died. So it's not like it doesn't affect them at all, but at least in, in the years that we were studying, it did not explain when they stopped over. Mm -hmm. where they went. Yeah. I don't know if you've been able to track individual birds over several years. Mm, just a few. Uh, that, do they have the same type of bird? Do they use the same strategy every year? Or? 
Right. Are they using a range? Yeah, it's a great question. We don't know that. We do know that um, males are relatively consistent in where they come back to in the summer, especially as Colby mentioned, if they're successful, it seems, in attracting a female. Um, and he, he talked about Steve Brenner's work where we move birds around, and they're, they're very keen to figure out where they are, and we moved them far enough. He mentioned if you move a bird from a low to a high quality, they stay there. We did the reciprocal, move birds from high to low, they return. And we made them go way further, like 10 times the size of their home rate. So they had to figure out, they knew exactly where they were going. They were back in the country. So they, they have the capacity to see Rhode Islanders. They know it well. And they can move back and forth depending on this. You had a question back? Uh, great minds think alike. I was going to ask the same question. Oh, so so let, me, let me shift gears then. Um, kind of integrating the two talks. The birds that you're tagging represent the northern, the final breeding stop, mm. and they could have been had a couple other stops yeah. beforehand. So I'm glad you're trying to put things together. We try to do the same thing, and the evidence that we have is makes it hard to do. So with females, we had breeding females that were successful a few years ago, and some of them showed back up, but most of them we don't see again, but may have been successful. What we think is happening from from Colby's talk is if they're successful down south, then they're actually finishing, they're going through the 25 days or so of, of incubation, then they're hanging out with their chicks for another 10 days, then maybe they try to breed again, but most of that multiple breeding is failed nests, which for an average female, she's losing more than half of her nests, so it happens a lot, and so that we think there's a lot of that movement. But if she's successful, I don't think she does, you know, she's not going to have time 